Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, this morning, I want to talk about the sovereignty of God. And I've titled today's message, Sovereignty Issues. Everybody say sovereignty issues. I'm going to be talking about sovereignty issues today. And the reason being, and the reason that I titled today's message, Sovereignty Issues, is because there are some issues dealing with the sovereignty of God God's sovereignty that the church needs to deal with, okay? Now, when I'm talking about sovereignty, I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about God's rule and reign and everything that falls within that, okay? For example, if I say God is sovereign, what that means is, is that God is the supreme ruler over everything. You believe that this morning? That He is the supreme ruler over everything and He possesses all power and authority. That's the God we serve. Somebody say amen this morning. Okay? That's the God we serve. But here's the thing. As pertaining to the doctrine of sovereignty, it's a pretty complex subject. And because it's complex, because it's uh, complicated and challenging, there's a lot of confusion in the body of Christ over the sovereignty of God and what all that includes and, and how that works and this and that. And, and as a result, here's a lot of bad, bad theology. All right? And so this morning, I am hoping that I can share some things this morning that's going to bring some clarity uh, to this particular subject and, and, and maybe even sharing some things with you that'll help, that'll help you and help us, all of us, to avoid the trappings of fatalism and complacency. Now listen to me, because, you know, because we don't have the right understanding or a good understanding of the sovereignty of God, what happens is, and I see it all around, that it's, it's like, man, it's, it's like we're all over the place on our theology and what we believe and how God functions, how God operates and this and that. And, and it's like, you know what, it starts to play out in our daily lives and in the way we look at things, the way that we act, operate, the way we approach things. And, and we got to get this thing back under control. You know, what do I mean by fatalism? I think most of us know what fatalism is, right? Fatalism is basically the belief that everything is already set in stone. In other words, what's going to happen is going to happen, and there's really nothing we can do about that. Okay, you heard that before. Well, guess what? That mentality works its way into our theology. And we begin, when we look at verses of Scripture, things in Scripture that, you know, that really emphasize and highlight the sovereignty of God, then we mix that in with, you know, the fatalistic kind of way of looking at things. And then we got a, we got a really bad recipe. we got a really bad mix when that happens. Here's what I'm talking about. I'm going to kind of share it in a little joke, so to speak. And I heard this a long time ago. I think it's pretty funny. And, and really, a, a lot of what I'm talking about today would be more recognized in uh, you know, for those who are familiar with like Reformed theology and Calvinism, but really the extreme elements of Reformed theology and Calvinism. But, but I heard this once and I just thought it was just real appropriate. It's like the Calvinist, he's, you know, he's, he's going downstairs to get something. He's walking down the stairs and he falls. And he gets up, dusts himself off and goes, well, I'm glad I got that over with. This is kind of where I'm going today, all right? We got to break away from this thing. And, and, and as Christians, we have got to understand how God's sovereignty works. Now, here's a, let me give you some other examples. See, when I use expressions like God is in control or God's got this, hey, he's God, I understand how that works. Because I understand and know that within the realm of God's sovereignty, God has put into place parameters of how He works and how He operates. In other words, there are some things, and the way we look at uh, things, there's, you know, as pertaining to responsibility and whose job is it, there are certain things, certain responsibilities that God has given to man that it's our job, not God's. There are certain responsibilities that we have to take on as humanity, saved or not. 
That as mankind, God has said, this is the way it works. But guess what? This is your job. This is your responsibility. What is it? Genesis chapter 1. God said, be fruitful, multiply, subdue, and have dominion. That's our job. Not God's job. Be fruitful, multiply, subdue, and have dominion. There's other scriptures that come into play. Think about this in Psalms. It says, it says God looks at, looks at the universe, and this is the way He looks at it, and this is the way He sees it. The heavens belong to God, but the earth He has given to the sons of man. Now think about that for a second. God is the creator of the heavens and the earth and all the things seen and unseen. God is all powerful. God is all knowing. God is om- he, he's all present. In other words, he's omnipotent. He's omniscient. And he's omnipresent. Okay? All powerful, all knowing, and all present. He's God. If God were to cease thinking about us, we'd cease to exist. That's God. Yet... As pertaining to the affairs of the earth and of man, there are certain things, certain responsibilities, certain roles and, and so forth that, that, that he has ordained that if we don't do it, it won't get done. Come on, preach it. Somebody's got this. <laughs> See, that fatalistic perspective looks at life and says, oh, well, you know what? doesn't matter because bottom line is, Hey, okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. Right? No, yeah, come on. No. Somebody say no. no. Let me, let me kind of give you, you know, let me explain where I'm coming from. And, 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 and don't get bent out of shape because it's going to be a little political, okay? All right? But, but you know what, just because there's some, there's some things going on in politics that, you know, can really give us a bad taste right now and so forth, that doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right? You know, and I'll say this, that the Sunday morning that Patrick Hampton was here, man, wasn't that an awesome message? That was an incredible message. It wasn't just a me- it was pro- it, it was prophetic, the things he had to say. And one of the things he said in that message that really, I mean, I, I never heard this before. I never even thought about it, but it was so profound. You know, he looked at the word politics and he made a comparison between politics and righteousness. You remember that? They're almost synonymous. In politics, people are trying to right wrongs. They're trying to push an agenda that will improve on things that's good for mankind. That's what politics is about. Trying to right wrongs. Trying to improve things that aren't working well for mankind. But in our political system, we have two parties for the most part. Both are trying to, do the same, uh, trying to do the same. But here's the problem. Which party is relying on the Word of God? Or is either party relying on the Word of God? See, this is the issue. This is the problem. I want to ask you right now. I don't need a show of hands. But as Christians, how many of you look at both platforms? Democrat and Republican. I mean, literally, went to their websites and you studied the agendas. Or did you just go with a person because you let the media tell you what to believe? I encourage you, the next election, before you vote, before you do your thing, make sure you go and you study the agenda line by line by line to see where your political representative and the person that you like and championed to see where they stand and what they're going to push and what they're going to promote. Because you see, I mean, look at what it says in the book of Isaiah. There was, Isaiah talks about a day that would come, and he says it this way. Woe to them who call evil good and good evil. Church, we got that going on today. You know, and I, I'm going to say it. I, I, I'm not even going to apologize. Listen. Listen. Anybody that can say that abortion in the third, come on, is a good thing, uh uh-uh. That does not line up with Scripture. Anyone that can say, well, you know what, it's no big deal, I don't care, listen, I 
I, 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 I get it. I know that this party believes that this party supports pro-life and this party doesn't. But you know what? And I'm a pro-life person. Oh, yes, I am. And then you go and you don't vote pro-life. And then there's that, that excuse that comes forward. Well, it's not that big of a deal. It's not really that. Im- it isn't. You haven't read your Bible. You don't know what the Word of God says about killing babies. You don't know about, you haven't read in the Old Testament that when the children of Israel would practice the sacrifice of killing babies, it brought a curse on the whole land, on the whole, in the entire nation. God, there's very few things in the Old Testament that God called an abomination. That's one of them. That's one of them. And so it's not just, oh well, I mean it's, you know, come on, Pastor. I mean, we can't be a one item. You know, I don't vote just for one thing. I vote for a bunch of things. Well, it was more than that. It was more than that. You know how many God things were on the table this time? How about not just pro life? How about pro marriage? God's kind of marriage. Oh, somebody said, Pastor, you can't talk about these things. This is going to get you in trouble. Church, I don't answer to the world. I answer to God. I know it's not a good thing right now, politically speaking and culturally speaking. But, I mean, we're going down the road right now, politically speaking, in the direction that our politics and government's going in. There's a day coming that they're going to tell the churches... You can't have that Bible in your church because look what the Bible says about homosexuality. So you, gotta, you can't go by that anymore. Enforcing laws and this and that. That Church, let me ask you this. Who do we look to for truth? Do we look to our government or do we look to God? Thank you. We look to God. And so what happened, and you're probably thinking, what's that got to do with the sovereignty of God? Here's what it's got to do. Because a lot of us as Christians, we got caught up in this whole, well, you know, whatever's going to be is going to be. K, Sarah, 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 you know? Here's, Here's where I'm going. In the weeks leading up to the election, I don't know how many times I I saw on Facebook. Or I heard in a casual conversation, and sadly speaking, or even worse, I saw a preacher preach this, and this is basically the way it went. Well, you know what? It really doesn't matter who gets elected president. Because bottom line, whoever gets elected president, that is who God purposed to be president. So quit worrying about it. Quit getting all upset about it. Now, granted, we don't need to be worrying about it. In the sense of where it it robs us of our peace and joy and it causes us to not be Christ-like. But if we're rejecting a fatalistic theology and we don't believe that everything is set in stone then there's, there's a role, there's a, there's a responsibility that we have as Christians, a part that we have to play in this. And I know of a lot of Christians. I know some, I know some, listen, I actually know of some that looked at it this way. They looked at the elections and they said, you know what, I don't like, any, I don't like either one of the candidates. So I'm not voting anyway, because you know what? God's got this. I mean, when it's all said and done, God's going to put in the He's going to He's going to put into the position of presidency who He wants to be president. Wrong answer. Amen. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You might be saying, "Well, Pastor, what about Daniel chapter two, where it says that he that he removes kings and he raises up kings?" Church. Everybody say context. You know, one of the things we got to quit doing as Christians is taking a verse here and a verse there, putting these verses together and trying to superimpose those verses on something that doesn't work. 
Be fruitful, multiply. Here it is. Subdue, have dominion. We're not to yield that dominion. When we say, well, I don't like either one of those candidates, it's not about the candidates. Look at the platform. Which platform was pushing majority-wise? There's going to be a little bit on it. Which platform mostly represented God's agenda? I'm telling you right now. It's pretty simple. God is not into abortion. Can I get an amen this morning? That's not a God thing. That's a devil thing. The devil comes to do what? There you go. What about, what about God's picture of marriage? Is that supposed to be Adam and Steve? Or is that supposed to be Adam and Eve? Come on. Oh, wait, somebody said... Pastor, that ain't cool. That ain't what I said. I just quoted what God said. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just championing God's perspective on this. Again, we got to get back to the places. What does the Word of God say? What does God's Word say? Because guess what? We're held accountable for these things. We are held accountable for these things. And so when we looked, and I'm just using the election right now as an example. So those of us who looked at the election and said, well, you know what? I don't like either one of the, the candidates or I got other issues that are more important. I, like I said, look at the platform. Which platform mostly represented God? And God forbid that I would put myself lining up against God's perspective on a certain matter. But in this... You know, again, looking at how the sovereignty of God works, well, pastor, it really doesn't matter because bottom line, that whoever ends up being president, that's who God purposed to be president. And that's not true. Amen. That's not the way it works. The heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth He has given into the hands of the sons of men or he has given to the sons of men and, and the, the, the bottom line is it's up to us whether we're going to take responsibility and that we're going to walk in a manner in a way which is going to come on stand up for righteousness or be opposed to righteousness this is the issue that's at hand today and as Christians as Christians, it's time that we realize that, you know what, th there's a responsibility, there's a, there's a part we play in this and that we've got to take the initiative. We have to take the initiative. Now, getting back to this sovereignty thing, and you know, you might be thinking, well, pastor, there's, there's a lot of scripture that basically says that God's the one who's in charge. God's the one who's, I mean, He's in control. He's the one that removes kings and raises up kings. He's the one that according to the Word of God says he works, at, he works all things according to the counsel of His will and that He upholds all things by the Word of His power. But wait a minute. Are we, are we kind of piecemealing Scripture here? Or how do we see this? How do we understand this? If that's the case, then who's going to do the witnessing? Who's going to pray for the sick? See, I hear this all the time. Now, here's one. You've probably heard this. Well, pastor, it really doesn't matter because you know what? I know that, uh, I know that, you know, sister so-and-so, I, listen, I know she's suffering and she's hurting and this and that. And, you know, uh, but bottom line is, you know, when her time comes, her time comes. I don't know how many times I've gone into the hospital when a family asked me to come and to pray for their loved one and I got in there and I go to pray and then I, I, it's like, I feel like that I've just created enemies because they didn't like the way I prayed. They're like, whoa, wait a minute. Who do you think you are? You're, you know, I never heard anybody pray like that. Listen, God's going to, when her number, when it's her time, it's her time. Right? You heard that one before? 
When it's her time, it's her time. There is a part we play in this. You know, I want to, dealing with sovereign, look, check this out. I want to look at Matthew chapter 10 because people really like to quote this one a lot. It says, it's verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. You read that and you're like, oh my. But do you know what the word will there means? The Greek word right there is anu. And it means a knowledge of. Not one falls apart from the knowledge of God. Because God's all knowing. God's all, I mean, he, he, he knows. He knows. Everybody say he knows. He knows. But we got to go back to this one is that there are certain parameters he's put into place that he's given us the respon responsibility to act on, and it's our part, it's our job to act in that situation. In other words, and I'm, I'm so glad my theology has, you know, God's opened my eyes to this. I used to be in that camp of, well, let's just, let, let's just pray and ask God to do this. Let's, let's just pray for sister so-and-so who's suffering and who's, who's really hurting and she's going through a... You know, she's, you know, this is not good. So let's just, let's just all pray to God and ask God to move in this situation and, and ask God to heal her. Well, I'm not, I'm, not really, I'm, not, I'm not really down on that. But is that according to New Testament Scripture? The mandate we have in the New Testament, Jesus said this, you go, you heal the sick, you cast out demons, you raise the dead. If you look at all the examples in the New Testament of praying for the sick, you don't see examples of those praying for the sick begging God to heal that person who's sick. Because God says, that's your job. I have the, the song that the worship team did this morning is a very appropriate song because He's given us the authority to act on His authority. Is it His authority? Yes. Is it His power? Yes. But He's not going to do our part our part is to lay hands on the sick, speak to that sickness, command that sickness, sickness's power and authority to be broken and to speak healing over that person. That's our job. That's our responsibility. And, and, and the list is, a, I mean, it's a mile long, but check this out. Look at this one. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. As pertaining to understanding the sovereignty of God. It says the Lord is... And I kind of went through that pretty quick. It says, willing that none should perish, but that, that all should come to repentance. Now check this out. It says, the Lord is willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, if we're going to put that it's God's will factor, and it's always God's this is the way He's going to work it, then that means nobody's going to hell. Because He's willing that none should perish. But it doesn't work that way. He's willing that none should perish. But until the body of Christ realizes its responsibility, that it's our job to witness, it's our job to share the gospel, it's our job to do outreach and to reach out to people, they're not going to get saved. It's our job. Are, the exceptions, are there exceptions to the rule? Of course there is. But there's going to be something in play somewhere where man had a role and had a part in it. Wow. It's quiet. I want to give you I want to give you seven things that as Christians, we are supposed to be responsible for. That we have to be proactive in and we have to do our part in. Number one, it's our job to pray and intercede. It's our job to pray and intercede. When when my son had his accident, when he was in his car accident, terrible, terrible, terrible situation, I am so thankful that I belong to a church that, that understands authority and, 
and believes in the power of prayer and doesn't buy into the fatalistic perspective of, well, whatever's going to be is going to be. Because I can tell you, I can give you example after example after example Day after day after day that when Nathan was going through it, especially those days in ICU, that when there were praying, when there were people there, people praying that things happened. I just look around the room right now. Gina, powerful the day she came in and just started singing the praises of God right there in that ICU waiting room. Tim and Ressy. Ressy's powerful prayers that, that day she prayed over Julie, basically laid over Julie, was in the floor crying. These are our, this is our response. These things are our response. It's our job to pray. It's our job to intercede. Uh, and, and as far as that, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of tie this to, you know, even Nathan's situation. I remember this, and it, 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 it so rubbed me wrong, is that when he was still in ICU, but he was off the ventilator, and he was able to, you know, interact and communicate and this and that. Even I mean, he was still in a bad way, but but uh, he could, you know, at least he could understand what you were saying and he could interact with you and uh, and so forth. A chaplain, this one day, a, a chaplain shows up, walks into the room. He's a hospital chaplain, and I know he means well. Okay, I know he means well. So he walks in and and he commences to talk to Nathan about the the will of God and the sovereignty of God and that regardless of the situation, the bottom line is you just got to trust and know that the reason this happened, God had a plan and a purpose. God had a plan and a purpose. And then he goes, he says, you know, look at me. He says, I can't turn my head. The only thing he could do, he could turn like this because when he was in his younger days, he had had a bicycle wreck. Went off the side of a hill and rolled a bunch of times and he ended up breaking his neck. He had to have his neck fused and all this other stuff and, and it caused him to be, he could only turn like this. And as God is my witness, this was what he said. This was his testimony. What a terrible testimony. He says, well, you know, it was God's plan and God's purpose that this happened to me because you know what? I was all caught up into being the best salesperson and, 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 and making the most money and I was all caught up. It was all about myself. But see, God, now check this out. He used the word allowed. We have to be very careful how we use the word allowed. God allowed this to happen because it was part of His plan and purpose because He wanted to break me. He wanted to get me into the place of where, where, you know, I could use this accident as a testimony to others and be able to minister to and comfort others. That's not the God I serve. Let, let's... I, I, I know that there's some aspects of that that sounds really good. But let's just look at it this way. You're a parent. You're a parent. And in your backyard is a... I'm just going to use this example. Just, just, you, 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 there's a pit bull in your backyard. It's fenced up. And this thing is just like... It's ferocious. And you've got a two-year-old. And I mean, it's already proven. It, it'll attack anything and everything that comes in the backyard. And you just open the door and say, go ahead to your three, two or three year old. Go ahead and go outside. Now, what would we think about someone who would make that kind of decision and act like that? Would we call that a good parent? Knowing that that, that pit bull is going to just devour that child, just, just, I mean, rip that child to pieces? Would we call that a good parent? then why in these kind of examples and these scenarios like I just talked about, why would we call God a good God? Come on, preach it. Why would we call God a good God in that? Now, God will take, God will obviously take any situation, but remember, that situation pertains to that which the enemy meant for evil. God will work it to our good. What the, the enemy meant for evil, not what God meant for evil. Look at this. Let's go to number two. Here's our job. 
Our job is to witness and share the gospel, to tell people about Jesus. Hey, to invite them to church. I would have never, the Sunday that I got saved, if someone hadn't invited me to church, told me about that particular church, what would have happened? What would have happened? I don't know. But I do know that someone played a major part in rolling that by directing me, giving me directions to the church I needed to go to, and going to that church, I got radically saved. Radically saved. So let me ask you something. When, when's the last time you witnessed to somebody? When's the last time that you talked to somebody about Jesus? When's the last time you gave testimony about, what, about the goodness of God and what God has done for you? Guys, we're living in a day right now where if the church, especially church people, aren't being proactive, <laughs> I mean, we're facing some, some, some major odds right now. And adversity. This, this generation, man, man, I don't think in the, in, in the history of the church has, has there been a generation so opposed to, to church. Think about that for a second. It's not God's job to witness. It's our job to witness. Look at this. Number three, here's our job. It's our job to live by God's Word. <laughs> Especially according to the New Testament directives. There's a lot of people saying, yes, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but have never read the New I mean, don't even understand, don't even, don't even have a clue about what, you know, what's, been, what's written in the New Testament and, and how we're supposed to live and, and so forth. Love your neighbor. Resist evil. There's a lot of wonderful directives in the New Testament that is so vital, so important to us today. I love what John said recently. I mean, God has placed in His Word, He's given us directives. He's given us, he's given us instructions in His Word. And these directives and these instructions are, are what's meant to help us to have an enjoyable and happy life free from the things of this world that's purposed to bring destruction. I encourage you, read the Word. Read the Word, especially the New Testament. Number four. This is our job. This is our, this is our responsibility. Most of you know this really well. Heal the sick. Cast out demons. Raise the dead. Come on now. Whose job is it? Is it God's job to heal the sick or is it our job? Well... This, this church is a rare exception because most Christians believe it's God's job to heal the sick. But you don't see those examples. You don't see it in the New Testament. It's, our, it's part of the Great Commission. Jesus said, as you go, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. That's our job. We're not supposed to be begging God to heal that person. We're not supposed to be begging God to cast that demon out of a... God is saying, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. I have given you the authority. I've given you the authority to lay hands on the sick. And guess what? If you start dealing with symptoms, lay hands on yourself. Speak to yourself. Speak to that symptom. I, I can promise you this, especially in this season we're in, this COVID-19 season, and you know, and it's, we're all, you know, shut up, closed doors, and this and that. And, you know, just recently, I've had to spend a lot of time with my mom. I've been praying with her on a daily basis. She's getting better each and every day. You know, good example. My mother has a crazy, crazy, crazy car accident. Ends up with a broken neck, broken back, 13 uh, fractured places in her ribs. 13. Now listen to this. 13. The doctor told me in ICU that typically... The way that you look at if a person is going to get through this, just, just take each fracture in that rib and just look at that and take that and just think, you know, that's 10%. The, the odds of that person surviving, and that even includes a young person with 13 fractures in the ribs. The odds of that person surviving is 10% of each fracture. That's 
what's that percentage? So what were they really saying? Probably not going to happen. She's probably not going to survive. There was even the discussion of moving into comfort care. I wasn't going to hear it. I would, I, uh -uh. I'm going to pray. I'm going to intercede. I'm going, I laid hands on her. I spoke to her body. I commanded, I commanded her to be healed. I spoke to her neck. I spoke to her back. I spoke to her ribs. I didn't beg God to heal her. I spoke to the, I did exactly what the scripture says to do. But here's the thing, all right? So she's home. Get her home and... You know, so I'm, I'm spending a lot of time with her because she still needs help. She needs care. She's got three cats. I love those cats. I caught two of them. They were strays. I caught them they were, when they were kittens. You can't catch a full-grown one. I mean, they'll tear you to pieces. But let's just speak to that thing. Sit down, kitty, kitty. <laughs> you ought to have seen my wife the other night. She grabbed hold of one of those cats. We had to clip its toes. She grabbed back that cat, jerked that cat up, and was like... None of us would touch it. Because that cat, you, Rachel knows what I'm talking about. But, but anyway, so here's the deal. So I'm going over there morning, afternoon, night, and I'm having to check. It, it, you know, and she's got three cats. I'm not even there a half a day, and I'm like. <sighs> but with all this COVID-19 information, this is, what, this is how the devil played in my head. Uh-oh, you got COVID-19 symptoms. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting watery-eyed. I'm sneezing because all this, you know, it's, it's, I haven't been around these cats. I mean, it's been a long time since we had a cat in the house. The last cat we had, Julie deballed, declawed, and cast out. <laughs> Ask Rachel. World War III hit our home over that. But he ended up with my mom. Merciless. <laughs> Poor cat. We're cat lovers at my house. But that doesn't change the fact that your eyes get watery and I get sneezy and this and that. So I'm, 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 my, my nose is running, my eyes are watering, I'm getting sneezy. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got COVID-19 symptoms. I got COVID. And then I'm like, no, no, in the name of Jesus, I am not going to buy into that. I'm not going to. No, I spoke to the I said, no, in the name of Jesus. No, I laid hands on myself. I spoke to those symptoms. I said, in the name of Jesus, I am healed in the name of Jesus. I cursed those symptoms and said, they're not going to have their way in my life. I am not getting sick here in the name of Jesus. Anyone, anybody else here believe that way this morning? Yeah. 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 Exercise your authority. Don't give in to that. Walk it out. Walk it out. Let's look at this one, number, number five. It's our responsibility, it's our job to look to the Lord for guidance and direction. We, it's our responsibility to let the Lord guide us, direct us, and order our steps. When I'm faced with, uh, with, with challenging situations, I need answers. I don't rely on the wisdom of the world, I rely on the wisdom of God. I'm going to spend the time in prayer that I need to get God's answer to get the guidance I need, to get the direction I need. God, I don't understand this situation. I don't know what's going on here. I need answers. And where most of us are in that situation, we'll, say, we'll be like, God, God, hear my, hear, hear my cry, hear my prayer. Help me, God. Help me, help me, help me. And, and if we don't hear anything right then and there, you know what we do? Then we just abandon, we, we quit looking to the Lord for answers, and we just go about our business doing worldly kind of responses and stuff. Guys, you got to be patient in that. Think about it. Why do you think the scripture says those who wait on the Lord? You got to wait. You got to be patient. God will come through. He will bring that answer. He will give that peace. He will give that guidance. He will give that direction. But a lot of times we're just like, oh well, God's not. And then we just go about life. There is, a, there, is, there is an importance in spending quality time with God. And you know what? And when you do, let God speak. Let Him, let him talk in that situation. A lot of times, you know, a lot of times the way we like to have our, 
we call it our quiet time, our prayer time, is we spend that 10, 5, 10 minutes, and the whole time we're the ones praying. Let's just sit and soak in the presence of the Lord and let God speak. <laughs> Let's let God speak. And I'll tell, you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you how else He speaks. He speaks to us through the Word. You get in, you read the Word, He'll speak to us through the Word. Here's another one. This is our responsibility. Verse uh, number 6. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. You're like, hey, pastor, how, how am I filled with the Spirit? Well, look at this. Through prayer, through reading the Word. Check it out. Participating in worship, which means going to church. You know, I talk to people a lot. You know, I, I, I get into conversations with people that I haven't seen in a long time, and one of the, uh, it, it never fails. It, this typically comes up. Man, Pastor, I'm just so dry. I'm just so dry, dry, dry. You are. When's the last time you've been to church? Well, you know, it's been weeks because, you know, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Now, this is a serious point right here. There's a reason why the Bible says, fail not to assemble yourselves. The reason that a lot of people are struggling today and people don't have peace and joy is because they're not part of the body. They're not linked up with the body. They're not praying. They're not reading the word. They're not going to church. There is a reason that God has put it. That, there's a reason that God says in his word, we need to pray. We need to read the word. We need to go to church. Because it's a benefit and a blessing to us. It's not to gain brownie points with God. It's because this is what God has put into place that will benefit and be a blessing to us as his people. You know, I will say right now, just scan in the crowd. If you're here this morning, you already pretty much, you understand this principle and have embraced it. That's a good thing. That's a really good thing. And there's many more, but the last one I'll share with you this morning is this. Number seven is this. This is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to walk by faith. I like it. Not by sight. It's our responsibility to walk by faith, not by sight. Our responsibility, it's our, this is to, to trust in the Lord. But what does that mean? You know, a lot of people, I've had, I've talked with people about, what does that mean, walk by faith, not by sight? That means that we walk by putting our trust in the Lord and in His Word versus the sight thing of relying on the temporal, on the nat, what, we, what we see with our natural eyes, what's going on around us, the circumstances. We don't trust in the circumstances. We don't look at everything that's going on around us and go, oh, my, 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 lions and tigers or, and, and bears. It, it's, we have to be the ones who walk by faith. It's our, response, it's our job to put our trust in the Lord. And those who trust in the Lord will not be ashamed, will not be disappointed. Those who put their trust in the Lord will not be ashamed, will not be disappointed. You believe that this morning? Let me get you to stand. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for your goodness and mercy. I thank you for your word that you've given us, your word. And that, Lord, that you've given us your Holy Spirit. That, Lord, that your purpose to help us in all these ways. Lord, and I thank you for your authority, the authority that you've given us to be who you've called us to be. I thank you that, Lord, that there's wisdom, that there's wisdom, that you are the God of wisdom and that you give us wisdom. Lord, I just pray for this congregation right now, for each and every person that's here and those who are watching, that, Lord, that as we move forward from this day, that, Lord, that you will help us to realize and understand that we have a part to play, Lord, in all of this, advancing the kingdom, embracing the great commission, being who you've called us to be. Lord, I just pray today, as, Lord, that as we leave, that, Lord, that there would just be a, a supernatural charge, a supernatural, just, Lord, where you just, 
Lord, pour out on each and every one of us that, Lord, that as we leave, we'll be, we'll, we'll be able to run with what you've given us and that we can be the people that you've called us to be in these last days, making a difference in the world around us. Lord, give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in these last days. Thank you, Lord. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. Have an awesome, awesome day and a great week.